by Professor Milena Griffoni from Regensburg, and she will talk about transport in DCAC-driven interacting Josephson junctions. Okay, so welcome everybody, and uh, of course I'm really grateful to be here, and thank you a lot to the organizers, so it was a big pleasure to hear all these amazing talks. And uh, yes, so uh, what I'm going to speak about today is something which is very much related to what uh, Christian has just said to us and also what we have heard in the morning. So uh, you see it is uh, transport in DCAC driven, Josephson junctions and let's say a bit like uh, Alfredo was saying this morning, we have a peculiarity that this is an interacting uh, Josephson junction. And maybe, however, let's say the new thing I would say compared to all the talks that we have heard so far is that what I will try to convince you is that you can use a particle conserving approach to superconductivity in order to describe a Josephson junction. So, and then uh, this is, let's say, the uh, setup that we are going to study. So we have our superconductor with uh, Cooper pairs the quantum dot and uh, let's say Cooper pair reservoir. And perhaps you can already notice here that I do, do not put a phase here. I don't put a phase phi L or a phase phi R. So in a superconducting uh, theory with particle number conservation, in fact, the phase is not defined. So this is maybe the main message. Right, now, uh, why should we look at the particle conserving theory? Because uh, I think that actually in a superconductor there is no U1 symmetry breaking. So I'm making a bit statement, but uh, in actually if you think the Hamiltonian you are starting from is something which is due to essentially Coulomb interactions or an effective phonon mediated perhaps Coulomb interaction. And this uh, Coulomb interaction has a lot of symmetries, but in particular has a, uh, has a uh, super selection symmetry, which means that it is invariant upon changing, say, the phase of a annihilation operator by e to the i phi. So this is, let's say, the mathematical way of saying that we have actually uh, particle conservation in our original problem. The second reason why you should perhaps do that is to think what is actually a current. So if you have a device like that, essentially what you measure is how much charge is leaving one of your electrodes. So for example, the left electrode, right? So if you have then a superconductor where you don't know how many particles you have, how can you define a current? So this is maybe another reason for this. The third argument that you could use is that actually when you look at the AC Josephson effect, we have heard a lot about this in these days, you apply essentially a DC bias to your system, which means that you have a difference of chemical potential, mu left and mu right, between your electrodes. And the uh, AC Josephson effect tells you that the supercurrent is proportional, in fact, so the frequency of the oscillations, to the uh, applied DC bar. So, and why is this? Because you have a reservoir of Cooper pairs which sit at two different chemical potentials, so mu left and mu r. Okay, so this is hopefully a good motivation to uh, maybe look at superconductivity in another way. And um, here I would like to make you think. So. Now let us consider uh, a free electron gas, so non-interacting electrons, and you know very well what is the ground state of this electron C. Mm? So what you should do is simply you take your vacuum, and then you, here you see you create a Cooper pair-like, mm? so K up, K down, and you fill up all of your levels until the Fermi energy. Right, so this is what we know from uh, <laughs> yeah, our uh, co courses in quantum mechanics. What you can do is to rewrite this thing in a slightly different way because let's say we are dealing with fermions so uh, you cannot create uh, two electrons in the same state. So actually here by taking let's say the power of M of this 
expression and adding a lot of zeros. Mm? And now you see already that what we have here is a linear superposition of states which all have the same total particle number m. Okay? Now, if we have a superconductor, we can imagine exactly the same thing. The only difference is that now I don't have the heavy side function anymore. I have a weight, alpha k, to these Cooper pair states. Mm? And the difference is simply that while the uh, Fermi C has a heavy side function, so either all the states are filled until kf and empty above, or let's say now I have the possibility also to have other kind of excitations also above the Fermi level. All right, then uh, we can go on and uh, let's say we can uh, postulate, as I said, this state. And this is now our ground state. It's not a BCS ground state. It's a state which has a definite number of Cooper pairs. You see? This is essentially a ground state which has been proposed by Leggett and long ago by Anderson. Now, the very nice thing of this ground state wave function is that it has a property which is an electron hole uh, symmetry property. So let us consider, let's say, our ground state with n Cooper pairs, and let us imagine that we destroy one electron, so we break one Cooper pair, if we wish, from our condensate. This is equivalent, up to uh, some prefactor, to adding a quasi-particles to a condensate which has m minus one Cooper pairs. If you now use this electron hole symmetry, what you can do is the following. So what you can do is to introduce what is called the Josephson pair operator. What does it do? So essentially, you start from your ground state with m minus one Cooper pairs here, right? So, sorry, the other way around. So you start with a ground state with m Cooper pairs, you destroy one, and you end up with this different ground state. Because of the symmetry that I was telling you before, you can then define a linear combination of CK up and SC dagger up, such that if I apply this UL operator on my uh, ground state, I get zero. Why am I uh, saying this? Is because we recognize immediately that we have a discovered a quasi-particle and the quasi-particle gamma is a bogolubum, as we know from the conventional BCS theory, and its action on the ground state is that is zero, right? So essentially, the superconducting ground state is the vacuum of the quasi-particles. And this is the definition of a quasi-particle. And the nice thing is that if you remember your Bogolyubov transformation, usually, you define your quasi-particles exactly like this. So gamma is a linear combination of an electron with weight u and typically a hole with another weight v. In this theory, however, we have charge conservation, you see, because of the action in addition of this S operator. So this is the only thing that you should remember. So we have constructed a theory which is essentially very similar to the one you are used to, with the difference, however, that now charge is conserved all through the system. And the uh, weight u and v of the usual BCS theory are related to this alpha that I was telling you before by these relations. Okay? Now, if you um, are happy with this, so maybe... Uh, I mean, many of you already, already know these things. So the, when you have the S operator, usually you call this uh, transformation the bogolyubov valatin transformation. Okay, now uh, maybe to summarize the first part of the talk, what I'm trying to convince you is what we can do is essentially to start from a full uh, interacting Hamiltonian, do a mean field as you're used with conventional BCS, whereby besides the usual pairing operator delta, 
we have here, you see, in addition, an S operator, right? So if you now count charges, you see, we, we create two electrons, so we gain two charges. At the same time, we annihilate a Cooper pair, so the counting of charges is fine. All right. And if we now apply the bogoliubov alatin transformation that I was telling you before, then we arrive at our mean field Hamiltonian, which has the form that you already know, right? So this is the quasi-particle part. E is the usual square root uh, delta square plus chi square. And also, we have the uh, Cooper pair part. Hmm? So essentially, our mean field Hamiltonian has two parts, the quasi-particle contribution and the contribution of the Cooper pairs which sit at the given chemical potential. Okay, fine, <laughs> hopefully. So this, I think, uh, it's the summary of this first part. All right, then uh, we are uh, able to uh, go on. And simply, I would like to mention that what I told you is something which is really old, because this was already in the original work by Josephson, 1962. So 60 years from, from now already. And if you look careful to his work, he has already introduced the quasi-particle operators. He has the S operators and he also has the bogoliubov alatin transformation. So this is really, really, really old stuff. Mm? Only simply revised, if, if you wish. And actually, uh, I mean, the, the, the main idea of Josephson was that because this S operator is creating a Cooper pair, when you calculate the commutation with the Hamiltonian, essentially you get two times lambda k, which is the chemical potential for him, and an S dagger operator. So if you look, this is a Heisenberg equation of motion, which means that the S operator have an evolution in times which is provided by the chemical potential. Hmm? All right, and then uh, he concludes essentially by looking at the current, so it's exactly what I was telling you before. So the current is the commutator of a tunneling Hamiltonian with the particle number, and he gets his famous Josephson current and the very important point is that the oscillations are due to the uh, time dependence of the Cooper pairs. Mm. So, so far, so good. Now, what is new at this point? At this point, what I would like to discuss in the time which I've left is how are Josephson ideas generalized to the case of interacting nanojunctions? And the second thing is what happens if we don't only have a DC bias, but also we apply microwaves, AC drive. No? So this is the topic of the conference, so it's important that we have AC drive. Right, so now let us really shortly define my setup. So this is a, a let's say, a single impurity Anderson model. So uh, the quantum dot with, say, the on-site interaction and the Hubbard interaction U. And then uh, we have, let's say, the uh, superconductors, and then we have the tunneling Hamiltonian. Now, uh, what I would like again to uh, mention, so if we uh, do the bogoliubov valatin transformation, we can express the uh, creation operator of the lead L, so this is a real electron. We can decompose it into two parts, right? So one part is, let's say, uh, I create simply a quasi-particle here, or in this other part, I destroy a quasi-particle and simultaneously I create a Cooper pair. Again, charge is conserved during this tunneling process. Okay, and on top of this, what we do is that we uh, apply, let's say, a chemical potential which has both a DC and AC component. All right, the current, once again, is given by, this is the current operator, and the current for us is obtained as a trace of the current operator over the total density operator of our quantum dot. So what we are going to use now in order to calculate the transport characteristic is not a Green's functions method as uh, this morning in the case of Alfredo, it's a reduced density matrix formulation 
which many of you know from quantum optics. Mm? So this is really a problem of quantum dissipation in fermionic environments. All right, then uh, maybe uh, again, this is the total density operator, so it is the total density operator of this full time-dependent Hamiltonian. Okay, now uh, the full uh, total density operator is, uh, I mean, uh, dynamically defined through the Duville von Neumann equation. And uh, here, for simplicity, I uh, express this uh, commutator, commutator in terms of a Liouvillian. So every time you see a Liouvillian, this means just a commutator of an operator O with a Hamiltonian HI. Mm? But this is a detail, uh, so forget it's not important at all. Uh, what is important is that uh, we have here a problem of having a time dependence. So when you have a time dependent quantum problem, and here is a many body time dependent quantum problem with interaction, it's pretty complicated. And what we want to do is to eliminate through a unitary transformation the uh, difficult part, which is the Cooper pair part. So essentially what you do, it's again, it's a detail, but maybe some of you uh, know this trick. So it was proposed for the case of Hamiltonian uh, systems already long ago by uh, Cuevas and also Alfredo in this paper of 2002. Essentially, by this transformation, just look at the final result. You have a, a transformed total uh, density operator where you don't have the Cooper pair explicitly anymore, you see? quantum dot, quasi-particles, and all the effect of the Cooper pairs is embedded now in a tunnel in Uvillian, which, because of the transformation, is time-dependent. Okay? So this is, uh, let's say, a trick which is quite important. And then at this point, I would like to stop. Mm? I would like to stop and let you think. So what do we have to do is to evaluate a current a current is given by a total trace over all the degrees of freedom of the system. So Hooper pairs, quantum dot, quasi-particles. So the thing that you want to do is to trace out all of these degrees of freedom uh, one after the other. And the first thing that you typically do is that you trace out the environment. By doing this, you transform a unitary evolution, which is the unitary evolution of the Liouville von Neumann equation, to an irreversible dynamics, which is also the reason why we have a steady state or a stationary current, okay? So the first question is, what is our bus here? Is the quasi-particle bus. So the uh, reduced density operator is obtained, in our case, by tracing away the quasi-particles and getting then a reduced uh, density operator rho prime. Once we do this, we are left with a reduced density operator which has degrees of freedom of the quantum dot and still has the degrees of freedom of the Cooper pairs. Okay, this is very important. Once we have done this, what happens is the following. So what happens is that the S operator enables us to transfer Cooper pairs from one part to the other. It means that the total number of Cooper pairs, left plus right, is conserved, but the relative number of Cooper pairs is not. And it is this delta N which varies, which is associated to the delta phi. So in this theory, the phase is not an absolute phase. This is the take home message of today. It's not that I have here phi left and phi right. I have a definite particle number. But because I can transfer Cooper pairs, I have a conjugate variable delta phi, which knows about this transfer of Cooper pairs from one part to the other. And this is what gives rise to the Josephson current. Okay, if you understood this, it's perfect. <laughs> the rest does not matter much. How much time do I have? Uh, okay, now uh, given this, uh, I tell you uh, how we do and I show you some results. So the first thing that I want to say is that 
if you trace out the uh, quasi particle degrees of freedom, you can do this, for example, using the Nagachima Tsvansi projector operator formalism. This gives you an exact generalized master equation for this reduced operator. Mm? The important point is that, okay, this is the free dynamics of the quantum dot, and then you have a uh, tunneling kernel, which now depends on two times because of the driving, and this is the object which will drive the system dynamics to the steady state. And the current, in turn, is given by an exact integral relation, whereby I have another kernel, the current kernel, which acts on the density operator, and here, as I was telling before, the quasi-particles have been traced away, but the Cooper pairs and the quantum dot are still to be traced out. Mm -hmm. Now, in general, these objects, these kernels are very complicated, but you can do a perturbative expansion in them, in principle, to all orders in the coupling to the leads, gamma, gamma squared, and so on and so forth. What I'm doing today is simply the easiest one, is the weak coupling, so sequential tunneling regime. If you want to have a, a supercurrent, you should go at least to the order gamma squared. I don't do this today. Mm. Okay, now, how does it work in second order? So in second order, you see we have two tunneling uvillians, second order, one, two. Then we have the uh, free dynamics of the uh, Cooper pairs and of the quantum dot acting on this uh, density operator. So it's not so important. What I want to simply to show you is that, of course, you can have an analytical form of the tunneling Uvillian, and you have various contributions. So, and in particular, you have your S operator, you have the um, D operators of the quantum dot, and also due to the unitary transformation I was telling you before, we have the full time dependence which is given by uh, the bias, which is due to the fact that we tunnel in and out the Cooper pairs. Okay, and if you explicitate this uh, phase, you will see that at some point your Bessel function will pop up, and you will see also that you have the DC frequency and you have the AC frequency. Details not relevant. And maybe the last thing that I want to, to say is that this kernel has a very nice interpretation. So once you trace out the quasi-particles, you see that you have these two contributions, so the normal one and the anomalous one, and because you have two of these tunneling uvillians, you have four possible combinations. So contributions where you don't have Cooper pairs involved, contribution where you only have one Cooper pair involved, or contributions where you have two Cooper pairs involved. Mm -hmm. and all of them uh, together will give you essentially the steady state current. And importantly, the um, quasi-particles give us these fermionic lines, and these are responsible for the reaching the steady state, uh, because give a finite memory time to the kernels. All right, uh, now uh, to the results. This allows us to get in exact form the stationary current with all of the uh, harmonics that you should have. The DC current can also be calculated explicitly and in analytic form, and I only show you again that we can get out the uh, contribution of both the AC and the DC, and the DC is, is, in, is in this new. Mm. So these are Bessel functions which have argument inside which is also oscillating in time. So Pretty complicated, but it's really exact to second order. And now, uh, two minutes and uh, I am finished because these things I think all of you know. Uh, so the, uh, uh, let's say, theory for uh, driven uh, Josephson junction is again very old. Dates back to Tien and Gordon, 1963. And what they had there was a, a, a superconducting, insulating, superconducting junction. And they wanted to explain an experiment where, let's say, upon application of microwaves, the VI uh, current characteristic was uh, showing peaks. And these peaks were spaced by a frequency 
that they could attribute essentially to the uh, applied uh, bias. And they were uh, explaining this feature by the famous Tim Gordon theory, saying, okay, if I have a current characteristic at zero applied microwave, I can have all of these replicas essentially by shifting the density of states by uh, photon channels, which the energy is shifted by n h bar omega and they are weighted by the square of, of the n special function. Mm -hmm. So this is the Tim Gordon theory. And actually, uh, we have seen already today, but um, you did not go into the details anymore, that uh, there are beautiful experiments where, again, you have these uh, kind of junctions, so SIS junctions, where uh, it's very nice to see, I mean, this is exactly what we saw before. Um, sorry. No, I, okay. Uh, that uh, you can really uh, see in a beautiful way these uh, Bessel function patterns, which was already predicted by Tim Gordon uh, long ago. Mm? The fact that we want to discuss now is what happens is we don't have a, let's say, a, S, I, S junction, but a quantum dot inside the superconductor. Again, here there is uh, some work done uh, 1996 by the MIT group of Van and Orlando, and they again wanted to uh, explain an experiment where uh, you had a quantum dot and subjected to microwaves. What they did there was again to use the uh, Tin Gordon theory this time saying that uh, what is shifted by uh, the microwaves are the tunneling rates uh, in and out of the junction. Okay, so, and uh, in our case, it works exactly the same, and maybe, um, because I don't have so much time anymore, I will uh, show you, uh, let's say, three slides with our result. So, the first, is the DC component of the periodic current at zero applied AC drive. And what you see here, this is a typical uh, stability diagram of a quantum dot uh, nearby the zero one uh, transition. And what you be beautifully see is the uh, superconducting gap. And uh, what I want to um, focus is, is on these three points, one, two, and three. So in this, uh, this is the current, it's not the differential conductance. So in point one, we have current. And this is simply because uh, you can nicely tunnel, say, from the uh, source uh, to the drain here through a level in the quantum dot. So this is quasi-particle transport. If you are in the situation two, there is no transport because essentially you have Coulomb blockade. And if you are in the situation three, actually you have the possibility of having in-gap transport due to thermally, uh, thermal quasi particles. In this case, you see, you tunnel from this uh, either uh, upper side of the uh, density of states to the other upper side of the density of states. Mm -hmm. And you can see very nicely this quasi-particle uh, peak if you do some scans. What happens if we apply the microwaves, <coughs> then we have all of these plethora of uh, multi-photon assisted channels, and you can again interpret them quite nicely in terms of photon assisted tunneling. Maybe what we can focus is on the uh, three, and in this uh, three uh, regime, you have a current inversion. So even if you have a uh, positive uh, DC bias, you have a current not from the source to the drain, but from the drain to the source, because you use, if you wish, a, uh, let's say, a photon in order to go from, let's say, from here to here, and then you can go, uh, yes, then you can go up. All right, and what, uh, we also were doing is a comparison to Tim Gordon. So if you would apply a simple Tim Gordon ansatz, this is what you would obtain here. But in reality, uh, it's much more complicated. Mm. So for example, due to the fact that you can have this current inversion that Tim Gordon would not give you. And finally, also in our approach, we can see the nice fans 
uh, where if you plot the, uh, the IDV as a function of the DC and the AC bias, you will see that the coherence, uh, I mean, it's not the coherence peaks uh, as we saw before, it's really, let's say, um, we, are, uh, we are essentially here at zero gate and we see what is going to happen. And again, if we, let's say, uh, have some uh, traces as a function of the AC uh, amplitude, you recognize very nicely the vessel function pattern. Okay, so with this I conclude. So I hopefully have demonstrated that it is possible to describe the full um, the IDV characteristic of a AC-driven Josephson junction in a particle conserving framework. And in this sense, uh, co the coexistence of two complementary views is possible. So here you see these roses which have been climbing into this tree, so you don't know what is what anymore. And I think that the particle conserving approach can open new perspective, and we are uh, preparing two manuscripts, so one on this stuff, hopefully we shall submit it in two weeks to the archive, and soon also the work on the Andrev reflection and the Josephson current. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Milena, for the very interesting talk. Other questions? Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm curious in the um, how um, compare the 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 two approaches, this particle conserving approach. So, in some limit, if you consider a, a non-interacting case uh, with the usual BCS approach, you can solve the the problem exactly by recourse to Green's functions. Uh -huh. um, and uh, if you, in this limit, you take uh, the coupling very small, you should be able to compare one to one with uh, this other approach. I'm, I'm curious about this comparison. Okay, so first of all, uh, also in this approach, if you have no interaction, you can solve, uh, you can solve this problem. So, uh, and also what we did is that we were using a Green's function approach uh, with a non-interacting level, particle conserving, and you get the Andrev bound states nicely uh, out of the theory. So the approach, I mean, I believe, I, eh? They are equal. They give the same result? Yes, absolutely. They, okay. So I mean, uh, the problem of the Green's function formulation, but we can discuss this afterward, in my opinion, is that it works pretty nicely at zero bias, you have big problems when you have finite bias. And when you have interaction, you have even larger problems. But uh, you have to do some tricks and you don't know uh, if the current is conserved or not, for example. So the typical case is the case of an NSN junction, uh, which very often you have to do some tricks in order to ensure con charge conservation, not in this approach, at finite bias. Okay, there was Thank you, Raj Milena, for the nice, uh, nice talk. So I, just to, to comment this, uh, maybe it's fair to say it's particle wave duality somehow that we, it's, it's just the uh, other sees things the other way around. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my question was, what, what do you think is the benefit of working with these particle conserved states? First question. Second question is more technical questions. Question, uh, you have presented results for the weak coupling regime and how do you think to extend this to, to, to strong coupling? Mm -hmm. Okay, as I was saying before, uh, the theory per se is exact, and uh, you can do in this formulation, so you have two things. So if you don't have interactions, then uh, you can uh, sum up the series, if you wish, so it's no problem. If you have interaction, you have to do some resubmission of some subclass of diagrams, and for example, this allows you to have also, I mean, not the cone effect down to zero temperature, but you could also have the cone effect in this formulation. So, and I think, let's say, uh, in my opinion, a big advantage of this approach is that I have under control every time what is the charge in my system. Mm? 
so, um, and as I said, I, I believe that, I mean, of course, if you have a phase bias, Josephson junction is no brain. You will do the phase approach, it, it's completely fine. But in this case, it's not phase biased. So, and in there, I think one has to be a bit more careful, yeah. Okay, another question. You see, people have been, when, uh, when there is this, uh, as you were saying, the, the standard theory of, uh, of Josephson Junction, and then there is Coulomb blockade. And we all know that this is basically two ways, two pertur perturbative treatments uh, of, of the junction. Um, and then the question has been how to connect, actually, these, these two regimes and theoretically. And, of course, you can formally write things down, but there is, it's very complicated to actually combine these two uh, limits. And do you think that the methods you, you have been developing, this, that there is yeah. ways to, to yeah. do so? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, again, I was saying before, uh, so again, so we have done this for um, normal leads, and uh, let's say this approach can go down uh, non-perturbatively, and uh, the, 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 the problem is that what is in this formulation an Andreev bound state? So the Andreev bound state is a pole of the tunnel intensity of states. So in order to have it, you have to have some self-energy. Hmm? And the self-energy only comes if you do this infinite resummation. And this we, we did, uh, so, and of course it's not exact, the self-energies that we get, but still you get all that you have to get. Yes. Okay, any other question? So I see no other questions, so let's thank Milan again.